Western Miami has used the familiar 5-2-3 formation that we saw last year during this preseason, but is a new system being worked on ahead of the last batch of preparation games that begins this weekend. Hello everybody and welcome back to Miami Total Football Radio. I am one third of your hosting team. My name is Franco Penizo. I am joined by Jose Armando and Steve Brenner as always. And of course, I am not going to forget to say Miami Total Football Radio. Had to get that in there, of course. Guys, how are you doing? It's a gloomy Wednesday afternoon. I'll start with you, Steve. How's everything going? Yeah, very on Florida like. I didn't I didn't come here for this, you know, and I want sunshine every day without fail. But um yeah, no, all uh, all good. Looking forward to uh seeing what, what transpires over the next sort of week or so with the, the team are going into preseason and just gearing up for the season starting. It's hacks come around so quickly. It's like the other it's like the final was only the other day. It's weird. <laughs> we are now in week four of Inter Miami's preseason. They have the Carolina Challenge Cup coming up, which we will talk about on this podcast, as well as a number of other items, including a glimpse at a new system that maybe Inter Miami is working on and maybe that Jose and I got a, caught a glimpse of this this past week. Jose, how are you today, my friend? Hey, Franco. Hey, Steve. Hey, everybody that's listening. Listen, I do believe this is this is one of the most important shows in preseason. Um, we have we're, we're just getting started, but I can already sense that we can actually give fans an idea of what the team is doing and where it is going. Because as we have moved on in preseason, um, there were a lot of things that you know we, we didn't know about how 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 was the team going to shape up on the field. Now we have an idea. Now we have a lot to to work with. So very excited about this show. We have quite a bit to dissect and analyze. And I know, I believe, just based off our conversation last week, Jose, that we are going to nerd out in terms of soccer terms on this podcast because we were two of only three media members that attended last Friday's friendly against CF Montreal. And obviously, we will be able to provide you with the information from that game, our analysis, our takeaways, and we will jump into and dive into all of that. Of course, if you are new here or if you're not new here and you have not left us, left us a review, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, formerly known as iTunes. It helps us out tremendously. We do have a special guest on today's episode as well. It's not an inter-Miami player or member of the team, but I do think he will provide plenty of insight into how the fans are feeling about the state of inter-Miami going into the 2022 campaign. And of course... This is the number one and most listened to Inter Miami podcast. So if you haven't already, give us a follow on all our social media channels, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It also helps us out in a big, big way. But enough of all of the pleasantries. Let's jump right into it. Guys, let's get to it. All right, fellas. So before we dive into last Friday's preseason friendly against CF Montreal... There was an open practice on Saturday I think we should touch on very, very quickly. DeAndre Yedlin, the star attraction or the new star attraction, was supposed to be unveiled or formally presented, and that did not happen because of weather issues that caused his plane or his flight to get canceled. So he wasn't able to make it. But, Jose, you were there in attendance. What did you make of the one hour or so session? It was pretty light overall because, as I mentioned, they played on Friday. So there wasn't a lot of intensity with regards to the to the session. But it was a fun, family-friendly event overall, would you say? Yeah, it was It was exciting. It was exciting to watch. I think um, everybody that went and really enjoyed the event. You know, uh, most of, uh, of the fans got an opportunity to get close to the field and and see the players and and of course since you know you're, you're not playing an official match and and it's a relaxed training sessions the the players were a little bit more attentive as well to the fans which you know it's it's nice to nice to see some of the players got um selfies with the fans you know the fans were able to see the players with their families towards the end of the practice as well so uh yeah i think it's it's a nice event you know um I think everything that happened it was what we expected because that that's what it is. You can get any more out of a, an event like that. So 
it was good. It was good. It was great. And and um, you know, a couple of things, of course. Um, you know, the pink nets. Yes, that, yes. You know, that's kind of tangent. I don't. Yeah. I listen. I have. I don't know if it was Lucho Lalo, eighteen ninety six, who's an avid listener of the show and who has brought up since last fall, maybe even last summer. He has asked in the Q and A session multiple times and referenced it multiple times that Inter Miami should have pink nets. And I believe we were all in agreement, or at least I was, that. You know, it's just, it's such a subtle and, and minor thing, but it would definitely add a bit. And Inter Miami showed that they had pink nets in the goals at this open training session. So that possibly a sign of what's to come for the season that they've maybe finally uh, added those pink nets just to add a little bit more of that pink flavor, that pink Inter Miami flavor to Drive Pink Stadium. So I don't know if it was Lucho Lalo 1896 calls that have been heard or or what, but maybe maybe we had a slight slight role in in that happening or maybe not but anyway it's cool regardless i think yeah it, it was it, it was it was very cool it was, it was very cool and, and you know the one thing also that i like about this is that you know sometimes um when you when you go to a match and you're sore focus on 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 the game you forget to see the human side of the players and and i really like towards the end the the you know the, the, that moment in time where you know players brought family on the field and they started to kick the ball around. You know that's always nice to see. It's always nice to see. And and sometimes when you criticize players because of uh, of what they're doing on the field and you start thinking about you know bigger things in life. And and so it's it's great to see that that as well from the players. We we did get to see Victor Uyoa's little boy run around the field. Um you know, we had brought him up on the on the podcast of a couple of weeks ago and we had Victor on and and we got to see him up close and personal do his thing. I've always just seen him on Instagram, but this time I saw him up close and personal on the the field at Drive Pink Stadium and he was running about in his traditional Uyoa way. Steve, I know you love talking about jerseys and pink nets and all these type of things. What are your thoughts on the pink nets? Come on, man. I know you've got a lot a lot a lot of uh, ammunition there. I think it's cool. No, I mean, there's no stipulation. Is there any MLS stipulation about net net colors? I'm, I'm not. I'm no. not sure there is. There's no. a stipulation about e- pretty much everything else in in the, in the world. Maybe not that. So there's, there's a loophole, pink loophole that Inter Miami have uh, gone through. But yeah, I mean, I haven't seen it up close and personal. What does it? What does it? What does it? What does it look like? It, it, does it look, does just, it look cool? just pink. It's just pink. Yeah, it looks it looks cool. It's a, it's a nice touch. I think it's a nice touch. Instead of having just you know basic bland white nets, you get a little pink in there. Again, Inter Miami's whole, you know, the whole brand and where a lot of the brand is about the pink and so I think it's a it's a nice minor touch that that does quite a bit despite being a, a such a small thing. I think Houston yeah. Dynamo at some point had, had orange. Uh, orange. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's nothing wrong with it. Colored nets, it's the future. <laughs> well, all right, <laughs> but there there were some updates, and we'll we'll touch on the updates that were provided during the press conference or the press conferences that followed the the open session with regards to the status of a few players. But before we do that, and before we switch gears, I do want to provide this information because this is information I, I was able to gather over the weekend. The open training session was an idea of Phil Neville. Phil Neville was the one that said uh, at some point in this preseason, look, I'd, I'd like to have an open training session for the fans and, and just be able to have them up close and personal a little bit closer to the team. So... If you enjoyed Saturday or if you missed Saturday and, and you wish you could have been there and you want to go to a future one, well, look, the, the idea originated from the information I've gathered from Phil Neville. So. I mean, yeah, li- listen, it's, it, it, just to be clear, it's not like a novel idea, is it, that, that someone feels just come up with and think, wow, that's an amazing idea. You know, a lot of clubs, most clubs do this, don't they? But, and, you know, it's, uh, it's just a way of just getting in. But if Phil, Neville, if Phil Neville had not brought it up, would it have happened? Because this hadn't happened yet with this team to this point. Now there well, there were there was a pandemic uh, before last season, and then the season before that there was no pandemic yet before before the season started. Um, it was the expansion year, but they still did not do something like this. So, you know, I, I think there was an event before with Diego Alonso, Alonso wasn't it? Like an open training. Uh, I think there was. I'm, I'm, I think I'm Paul, blanking. Paul McDonough know. had it written. I think Paul McDonough had it written in his contract never to stage any uh, fan fan things like that. So uh, <laughs> I, I, that's not true. That's not true. But <laughs> I don't remember Diego Alonso having anything. I don't. I don't recall. I know Diego Alonso had his, and it's funny enough. We, I spoke about it last night with a couple of people. Diego Alonso had his introductory press conference at the Rusty Pelican, which is a nice uh, place to visit in in Miami. But 
know. From the Rusty Pelican to the World Cup final, the Diego Alonso <laughs> story. There, there. Who wants to write it? I think I think uh, Steve. I, I think Steve should write it. Steve should. It's uh... being written right now, mate. The stars. <laughs> you know. You'd make a killing in in Uruguay. Uh, okay, okay, well let's let's switch gears because let's let's get to a little more serious note here, and that that is that again there was a preseason friendly on Friday that was largely closed doors. But Jose and I were able to attend, and we will ex- bring you exclusive details with regards to that preseason friendly, which Inter Miami took the lead in in the first half off of a Gonzalo Higuain goal off of a feed from Ariel Lasseter, but then two Drake Calendar blunders in the second half undid that work, and Inter Miami falls by the two to one score. Jose, we can dive into any number of things, but. I'll let you just begin. Clean slate. You can start with whatever you want. Your biggest takeaway, a small takeaway. What do you want to share about that game? Um, well, I think one of one of the uh, exciting things to watch when you get to go to um, to preseason games, and, and especially when they are closed door to fans but open to media, is that we're closer to the field. It happened against this, this United, and it happened again against Montreal. And, you know, it's always interesting to see the, to listen to the communication between players. Um, so I'll point to that just as an overall thought. But then again, you know, we had the opportunity to watch Damian Lowe play. And, um, you know, which it was interesting because, you know, obviously we were coming off the, the FIFA window. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, yes, he was the only one coming out of the FIFA window that was starting that game. Obviously, he had a suspension with Jamaica, and that, you know, provided him with a little bit of more time to recover. Um, Quinteros did not play that game. So, um, Damian Lowe, you know, you can already tell. You know, he's, he's a quality player in the back. He, he changes the dynamics. Um, Ian Frey, again, solid in the back and moving forward as well. Very impressive. And, of course, formation. You know, that that's, that's something that we... That we touched on as soon as we saw it with Franco on the field, um, you know, having. Uh, well, wait, 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 before, Lowe. before, before, yeah, before, I was gonna say before we jump into the formation because I think that is the the meat and potatoes, and that is the main point of what this right. this podcast this week will be about, and that's what the title <laughs> of the podcast is. It's five three two, because we did see a different formation. We did see a different look from Inter Miami in this game, and and what maybe gave us the exclamation point that this is something that the team is really looking at this season is Damian Lowe's press conference on Saturday after the open training session because there was no media availability after the friendly. We did not speak to anybody, but on Saturday after the practice session, we did. And Damian Lowe was formally presented to us and in a press conference setting. And one of the nuggets that he dropped in what I thought was a very good press conference from him, a very good speaker, was that... Phil Neville and Chris Henderson, when they, you know, when they were assessing bringing him over and they spoke to him, they wanted to see what system he could fit in. And he name dropped three systems. He said 4-3-3, 3-5-2, and 5-3-2, which we had not seen the 5-3-2 until this game. And then he goes and says that. So clearly it looks like that's something that Phil Neville is considering for this season. So, Jose, I, I'm going to get your thoughts as well, Steve, but Jose, you saw it up close and personal. Damian Lowe the next day says it. What are your thoughts on the team playing this formation and what are your thoughts on what it means for the or for the style of play? Um, listen, I think there are two key players for this formation to give me some hope. I'm not completely sold on the the five man back line or, or three man so but i can agree with the argument that kieran gibbs and deandre jetlin can give um offensively more options to this team right because you would you would believe that kieran gibbs showed enough um last year moving forward that he can be productive for this team on the attacking part of the field. And Yetlin, we already know what he can do. That's basically the reason why he's here, because he's not a great defender, but he's good with the ball moving forward. So 
Um, with that being said, I think there's a possibility a possibility that could work. But initially, I I would I I would think that you know the better option for this team, with the talent that they have forward, it would be playing with 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 four in the back. But again, we haven't seen that yet. So indication indications are that they would be playing with either three or five in the back. We were talking before a recording with Franco. I do believe that. You know, they have played both of these formations in preseason. They play with three in the back when they have the ball and they try to move forward. They haven't been as effective with it. And they play with five most of the time because they don't have possession and they have to stay um, behind just playing a solid game defensively and trying to um, hurt the other team in the counterattack. So um, if that's the plan, then listen, so far, I think it's been working in preseason, but I don't know if he can sustain that for the entire regular season. For me, that 5-3-2 formation works for um, U.S. Open Cup, you know, MLS is back tournaments, but for a 30-something game regular season, I don't think that's a, that's a good plan. So before I get Steve's thoughts, I think you touched on the wingbacks, but for me, the most interesting thing in the 5-3-2 is that it's Gonzalo Higuain and in this case it was Gonzalo Higuain and Ariel Lasseter that were playing as the as the two forwards in in the formation. When we saw the Universitario game, Inter Miami played you can again you can call it a five man back line or a three man back line, but just to try to simplify it and not confuse anybody here with all these numbers, Inter Miami played a five two three. Because they had effectively Gonzalo Higuain up top, and then they had two wingers in Ariel Lasseter on the right and Robbie Robinson on the left in that game. Now the 5-3-2 takes away the wingers. Now you have two forwards that are playing in more central positions, and you have an extra midfielder in the center of the park. And that that's the biggest difference for me. The wingbacks, we know the wingbacks are going to be there to, to help provide with and try to get forward and, and help with the attack, as well as obviously get back, track back, and defend. But I think the biggest difference is you're taking away a player from a more advanced position and trying to help out with more numbers in midfield. Now, what does that mean? Defensively, you're trying to clog up the center a bit more. You have more bodies there. You're also probably trying to win the battle in the center of the park to to have more possession, which Inter Miami did not have a whole lot of, uh, at least to start in that game against CF Montreal. It took them until the the 25th minute, maybe the 30th minute mark to really find their footing and start winning back some of the ball. You know, even though they didn't have a lot of the ball in that first half, they still were able to limit CF Montreal by and large. I don't really remember them testing Clement Diop all that much in the in those in that first half and even in those first 30 minutes. But Steve, you didn't ha- you haven't seen it yet, but just listening to it and thinking about the personnel available a 5-3-2, do you think that suits Inter Miami's personnel? Do you like the idea just from you know listening to it? Or do you think it's better for them to stick with a 4-3-3, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's it's it is all about the players in the end of the day. I know it's a cliche, but with amazing timing in my football manager game, and I'm not to be our football manager every week, even though I have been. <laughs> it's a new thing. It's a new it's a new Steve Brenner primo thing for twenty twenty two. You just get a name drop football manager every week. Well, I've left Orlando after eight games and I'm now manager of River Plate and we're actually playing 5-3-2 right now. So, but what, you know, I think the centre-backs need to be able to pass the ball because if the, the wing-backs are pushing on, you know, if you have like a wide centre-back, which effectively is, it could be like a sort of playmaker at the back and just give off the easy balls and then try and hit longer, um, you know, it gives them different options. And he sees, I think, I'm, I'm correct if I'm wrong, but Mabiko maybe could be, you know, that guy to with the, just to, he, he looks good on the ball. Um, you know, he's quite physical, so that could work for them. And then you know, the, the midfielders will then drop in when the wing backs go forward, and they will compensate for each other. Uh, the fact, what the difference I like is the fact that there's two up, there's just two up top, so it just gives them more options. I just felt, you know, Iguain or whoever else it was playing up front, they always just look so isolated. And maybe with with just this formation, you've got you know two two up top. You know, it could be a pressing forward or a deep lying forward, or there's just being a lot of it interchanging. It puts pressure on the on the midfield three because they've got more work to do, getting back and getting forward. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I I think it can work. And you've got Yedlin up one side, and maybe Kieran gives up the other. 
fitness, you know, depending or whatever, then I think, you know, it, it can work. But it also just depends on the on the players and the, the squad will be fluid in terms of it can change for different scenarios. Like, you know, they don't just coach one tactic, they coach, you know, many to, to, to adapt to the game. So it just, it's all about the players at the end of the day. So while, while it is a 5-3-2 and, and that's just to help simplify things, I have heard in the aftermath of this weekend that it might play like a 5 3 one, one with Iguain dropping a bit deeper and I don't know if playmaking is the right word, but helping create some things while the other forward stays more advanced. Now, we didn't necessarily see that in this past uh, Friday's game, Jose, because... Yep. Uh, second half. I told you about it. In the second half. But in the second half, the, the, the team the team made wholesale changes about 10, 15 minutes in. So. But, I mean, it's formation, right? I mean, it, it's not about the names. It's about the formation. We did saw we, we saw a little bit of that. But I think we saw it by nature as well. Because, you know, um, either... Remember, Lassiter is, is not exactly a, a nine, right? So, by instinct, he, he's going to move down a little bit. He, he's trying, He's going to try to get some touches. So... That's mainly when we saw it, but when he was trying to get a little bit more involved with the ball. Now, I, mean, I don't think we're going part, to see it that way. I think we're going to see Iguain drop and pick up the ball, and Lasseter stretching defenses and and trying to get him behind because Iguain does not provide you that. We've seen it last season was clear as crystal that Gonzalo Iguain will not stretch a backline. Just doesn't have the speed at this point in his career. Right. Well, anytime, actually, and this is a uh, my observation, my analysis from last year. Anytime you saw Gonzalo Higuain get in behind the defense and he was racing it on goal op- with you know yards of space, the, the offside flag went up. So he the timing is not is not right anymore for him in terms of that and, in, and he just doesn't have the wheels. He doesn't have the speed or the pace to do it. So how do you how do you make your attack a little less predictable? How do you make it more dynamic? You need someone to stretch that back line, and I think that's going to be whether it's Ariel Lasseter or Leonardo Campana, someone with a bit more wheels than Gonzalo Higuain. So I, I think we will be seeing Gonzalo Higuain drop as we've seen him drop in in different formations and different systems. I think he'll be the one playmaking, and I think you'll see the other players going forward and, and, and looking to make those runs in behind. Now, that doesn't mean Ariel Lasseter will never drop to try to find the ball, um, as we may, maybe saw on Friday. But by and large, I think Gonzalo Higuain will be the one that withdraws while the other one stays high and tries to make those those uh esa corridas a la espalda which in english would be uh those runs off the back shoulder so i, I think well, that's what we'll see on the shoulder of the last defender yeah yes yes it, it comes down to to availability as well because maybe the reason we haven't seen this this formation before in the previous uh um, preseason matches is because you know there was there are just so many players that could be involved offensively that are not available. Like we saw Campana train for the first time, and I think Phil mentioned that in in, in the press conference, training for the first time with, with the team. Um, Emerson Rodriguez is still you know not not available. Robbie Robinson not available. So you know maybe the first uh, game uh, of the regular season is going to come down to who's available and. And what can Phil put put out on the field that is going to be competitive? Because if you th- really think about it, with the five three two formation, um, where's is Robert Robinson part of that idea? Uh, is he back to being a nine? What is his position there? Because I don't see Robert Robinson playing in the middle of the field. I don't know no, about you guys. No, I mean I would imagine if he's deployed in the five three two that he'd be one of those two two forwards and probably the one that stays higher and tries to to stretch the defense because that's part of his skill set that's part of his strengths is his speed and you know we did see towards the end of last season let's not forget that Robbie Robinson was taken away from the wing and used more in the middle and you know we we had all three of us had healthy debates about whether that was played you know that was playing him to the best of his abilities of having him in central spots was was what best suits him but i guess in the 532 if he does see the field because he did not play in this one on Friday, although he has suffered an injury that was confirmed by Phil Neville on uh, on Saturday after the open training session. You know, I think he would be in one of those those two forward positions. I don't see him in the middle of the park as as you know three potential eights or sixes. Which look look at the formations and the and 
how Damian Lowe labeled him. 5-3-2, 4-3-3, 3-5-2. You could have a 10 in there. You could, but we talked about this last week. I don't think Inter Miami is going to have a 10 this year. I think when Rafael Vega and that that ship sailed, when that move did not come to pass, I think they said, all right, let's 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 change gears here a little bit. I don't think that we're going to see an out-and-out 10. I'm more convinced about it now than I was last week, and last week I was very, very convinced about it. Steve, what, no, do, you th- let, what do you think? Wait, I wanna, yeah. What does Steve think? Does Steve think they still might go for a 10? Or do you think everything that's every, all the signs are pointing to no 10, three midfielders or two midfielders and either wingers or, or two strikers? What, what are your thoughts there, Steve? Well, I mean, you know, they're, um, they're, you know, time's running out now, isn't it, to bring someone. I'm sure they're still working on it. But as we said, it's, the season is kind of coming upon us pretty quick. So this is the plan, I, I guess, for, for now. And if, if the targets come off and, you know, Chris Henderson did, intimate didn't he that potentially someone could come in in the when in the summer or you know when european season everyone else finishes um so yeah we'll have to wait and see but this is this seems like the, the plan right now and then it, it could change if someone else comes in but everything's up in the air jose you had something to add there yeah i just wanted to make it clear that you know when we mentioned three five two those five players in the middle are not necessarily midfielders. You know, you have to put in that in that list of five players, DeAndre Jetlin and Karen Gibbs. I mean, and then you have three real midfielders. That's just the nature of the of that formation. You know, it's it's right. The three five two is essentially the five three two just in a more attacking right. posture, right? But that's Correct. that's that's how I mean at least that's how we're interpreting it. That's how we're interpreting so, it. Maybe maybe it does become a five midfield look with actual wingers and there's no wing backs, maybe, but um, you know, I I interpret it as just being the, the, the five three two in an attacking posture. So you basically have one spot left. Right, because you would think. Let's pretend that there's five in the middle. So we have two now: Gibbs and Yedlin. Um, Mota is playing. Gregory is Guy playing. He's play. the captain. Sure. So there's only one spot left in the middle. That's it. That's that's all to figure out. Is that going to be a ten? Who is it going to be? I don't know. But that that it is what it is. That's it. That's why in, uh, when we were getting started. In this podcast, I told you, this is the podcast where we can actually explain to people what is going on because we have seen it on the field. I remember I was talking early on in the in preseason about how the starting lineup would look like, and it was hard to tell just a few weeks ago. Now we have a clear idea of what's going on, at least when it comes to the five three two or the three five two. The four three three is something that we have yet to see, and maybe we'll see it this weekend. I'm surprised that they, you know, maybe Damian Lowe misspoke on a formation. Maybe he missed a, a formation. But I'm surprised that he didn't mention what we saw against Universitario, which was the the five two three with two wingers and a striker. I'm surprised that they're not working on that, or that you know that's not something that that was mentioned to him by by Phil Neville. But maybe again, maybe he misspoke, or maybe he omitted that uh, unintentionally. But we will see. We will see if that formation returns at some point in 2022 i do want to touch on the midfield really quickly uh and and maybe we can close out on this unless there's other other takeaways you want to share jose but in this game there was no real creative presence in the midfield it was mostly three workhorses that clogged up spaces that when they had the ball they tried obviously finding guayne but it wasn't really anyone that could break lines i think maybe gene mota as the half War on. He got a little bit better. He did hit the one. He did hit the ball to Ariel Lasseter. That then Lasseter finds Higuain for for the goal. And if you haven't seen the goal, you can find it on uh, on YouTube or on my my Twitter handle at Franco Panizo. I've I've put out the link with the uh, the highlights or the three goals from the game that CF Montreal shared on on their channels. But I didn't see anybody in there that was a real creative force. Or, and we talked about that's why they were struggling so much in the first 20, 25 minutes with having the ball and, and moving the ball forward and creating chances. Because Gonzalo Higuain's goal was was essentially, at least from my memory, the real first opportunity, scoring opportunity Inter Miami had. They didn't penetrate a whole lot into the final third. They didn't really create a whole lot. But they were opportunistic and efficient with the one chance that they had, or effective with the one chance that that they had. But by and large, they were in a lo- in a deeper block of, I guess you could call it eight, five, and three, 
And they were just clogging up spaces. And although CF Montreal had possession and had the ball and was moving it side to side, they couldn't really find any openings. And Diop was largely, largely untested. So we talked about it. Is that what Phil Neville will look to deploy this season? Is that the type of tactics we might see from Inter Miami in 2022? Obviously, we'll get a better idea once the season begins. But do you think that might be what we see from this side in in this upcoming campaign? A team that tries to keep a zero at the back, closes up the spaces in behind, and tries to prioritize keeping that zero and then trying to be opportunistic at the other end. Because I think, you know, I think we, we both agreed that that first half, they didn't play great from a soccer standpoint, but they defended well and they took their chances and they were up 1-0. And I think that could be the formula. I think that could be Phil Neville's formula for this upcoming season. Yeah, I, I do I do agree with that. Um you know, the one problem that I've seen um, throughout the preseason is possession. And maybe that's a, a pro- that's not a problem for Phil. You know, maybe he's comfortable with his team being well organized, not having the ball, but getting three or four chances and maybe putting one or two in the back of the net and then you win the game. Maybe that's that's what he feels comfortable with. You know, um, they, they have struggled with possession throughout preseason. They did a good job towards the end of the first half. And again, preseason and, and this game on Friday, it's the same thing. First half is is what we look at because that's where you see the starters and, and you know, that's, that's, the, that's the moment that you can really take a read on as, as you move forward. So I do agree with you, um, obviously, from, you know, from the point of view of a fan, I'm not very happy about that because, you know, that's... It's not sexy. Not it's not sexy. Brand of soccer. Right. And but, I, I wanted to know, ask Steve. I do want to ask Steve because he's been quiet over there. Steve. And, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Jose, but Steve, I want to hear from Steve here. Do you think Inter-Miami fans will take to that? Do you think that they will take to a team that does not play maybe super attractive style of play, doesn't have a very super attractive style of play, but gets wins? Do you think that they would take that? Or do you think that Inter Miami has to, from an aesthetic standpoint, at least show something to continue to to keep the local fan base uh, at large invested and interested in the team? No, they just got, just got to win. I mean, you know, we, we're talking about a team that have really done pretty poorly over the last couple of years. They haven't got any real world beaters in the squad they haven't got a raft of creative you know sort of talents that they can just rip teams apart they're, they're going to have to be functional right now and also remember you know the new players coming in it's a different roster etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, no I think that they would the fans would appreciate just effort on the pitch and and, and, and results and, and the, the performances will come like, like, like anything I think you've got to for a team that hasn't won enough games in the last two years you've got to just concentrate on just trying to get get the wins and then and then everything else should fall into place after that. Jose, you wanted to add something there before I cut you off so rudely. No, no, no. Um, just, just again, to point out the fact that, you know, as you move forward in the season, we're going to see different versions of this team because of so many things going on, because of the necessity of winning, of getting points, of gaining some momentum. Um, you know, just like what we saw last year when they had a good run, you know, they try to keep things up the way they were and they didn't, didn't change much, even though we were asking for them to be a little bit more aggressive towards the end because they needed to win. But, you know, Phil felt comf- comfortable with the formation and he basically ran it out until, you know, he, he needed to change. So, you know, it, it's still a process. Remember, this is a this is a brand new team again. So what we see so far in pre- preseason, it's more oriented on having a solid defensive effort and I think they have been able to accomplish that so far. Now there's the other side of, of the field that you have to work on and, and see how things shape up when, when you get all the players that are not available right now. So I will answer the question I, I, I posed to Steve really quickly because I think if Inter Miami can win while playing maybe an unattractive style, then fans, at least in the short term, won't care all that much. Especially after how the last... Two seasons, especially last season, went. But if they play an unattractive style of play and don't get the results, then I think you're in trouble. Then I think things could go could go south very quickly because not only are you not playing anything remotely exciting, you're also not winning games. So 
we'll see what Phil Neville goes with once the the games get going. We actually might get a, a more of a of a preview beginning this weekend with the Carolina Challenge Cup because there's three games on the men there before or three games on the schedule there before the the start of the MLS campaign. So maybe we'll get more of an idea there. But but uh, let's see let's see how let's see how they approach things because I agree with you that as the season goes on, Phil Neville will introduce different tactical wrinkles and and maybe try to become a a side that wants to play a bit more that has more tactical sophistication with the ball but right now it's it's laying the foundation and it's maybe just being defensive minded and and trying to to frustrate the other team because that's what Inter Miami did CF Montreal had the ball but couldn't find the opening and that eventually led to Inter Miami wrestling control away from them and then them finding their way and starting to to win more possession and get into the opposing half which again didn't lead to a whole lot of chances but it led to the one that leads to the goal and that's all you need sometimes in football so one other thing i'd really quickly like to touch on is how much size this team has how much height this team has and i don't think that's by coincidence because this team although it didn't create a whole lot it did get some corner kicks and you could see the amount of aerial threats that were on the field for inter miami which was a stark difference from last year you had Breck Shea, you had Damian Lowe, you had uh, Christopher McVeigh. There, there were numerous targets in the box. Gonzalo Higuain was the one on the... He was crossing the ball in from the corner kicks. He was sending in the set pieces. So I think this team, again, very well could be defensive-minded, looking to be opportunistic, looking to pluck goals either on set pieces or on the few chances that they have when they are in the attack. But last thing I want to touch on very, very quickly is... The state of the team, it's something Jose mentioned a little bit ago, and that is that there are multiple injuries on the team right now. Multiple. Not just a few, there are several. And I don't know if that's a cause for concern or something that needs to be checked out, but Inter Miami does have a few walking wounded players right now. And we we got updates on, on a few of them after Saturday from Phil Neville. And he said Leonardo Campana, as we saw, was back in training with the team or was in training with the team for the first time on Saturday. Emerson Rodriguez should not be too far behind in terms of his recovery. But that Robbie Robinson and Bryce Duke, who are both ailing from injuries, that they're a bit further away from recovering. Nick Marsman is also ahead of schedule in his recovery from the knee injury he suffered in 2021. But he's a question mark for the start of the season. I've also heard that there are other players that have come back with... uh, Well, Jairo Quinteros is one. He came back with an injury from international duty. So that's why he he didn't take part in Saturday's training. That's obviously not Inter Miami's fault. But is it a concern for you guys that there's this many injuries at this point in the preseason? Or it's not a big deal? Steve? Uh, I mean, you know, like the turnaround is pretty short, isn't it, from one season to the other? Remember, we're start, starting the season a bit earlier this year because of the World Cup, the back end of this year. Uh, right, it's preseason. You know, people are getting back into it. Yeah, I mean, you don't want injuries now. It's probably the, the, the you know the worst time, but fortunately, yeah. uh, they can happen any time. Kieran Gibbs is also not a hundred percent yet, so that's an, that's another name I forgot to mention. Yeah. I forgot to mention there. Jose, is it a big deal? No big deal. Um, right now, no. But a week from now, if uh, you know the numbers remain the same, or you keep adding players to the list, then you start to you to think about it. But um, Gregory from, also, from... Gregory, sorry, Gregory also has not played yet with the team. He also has not. Um... You know, he's been in practice, but he hasn't played in a game. I think he was training with the team though on on um, Saturday, right? You know, I mean. When when, when yes. I say training with the team, it means you know working actually with the not on the yes. side, but with a group of players that are um, fully fit. So maybe he's he's a lot closer than everybody else. Um, yeah, I don't think it's concerning right now, but you know, give a week a week and a half and see how things are going, and and you know we, we'll have a better idea of of, uh, of 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 the of the injuries that they're trying to recover from. Maybe. You know, sometimes it's just prevention, not not trying to get things worse than what they are if you don't have to, right? Because, I mean, you still have time to, to recover. I don't think it's concerning, but I definitely think it's something to keep an eye on because this is a brand new team and we know that they've breached patience and the process. And obviously preseason is a good time to develop 
some of the understanding, some of the chemistry, not all of it, but some of it. And with so many pieces missing and so many pieces, important pieces in and out of, uh, or out of the lineup for at least this first half of preseason, I think that that's, uh, obviously is a blow for the team. I, I, obviously they would rather have the full complement of players practicing and being able uh, and available to play in preseason games than not, but that's obviously not how it has played out. And, you know, that could impact things once the season gets rolling because now you're, you're making up for lost time if these players don't come back uh, before then. But last thing, last question I have for both of you before we close out this segment. I'll start with Steve. Does it matter at all that Inter-Miami has just one win in four preseason games? Yes or no? No. But it, they could do with a couple of wins in the next few games. <laughs> okay. Jose, does it matter at all if it, that Inter Miami has one win in four preseason games? No, I don't think I don't think it matters at all. And um, again, going back to the first half against Montreal, they, you know, they they had a good showing, and I think that's it, it's unfortunate that you know not not everybody gets to see that, and and you know everybody reads the paper the next day or or and just uh, you know you know go by the result of the game, you know. But no, I don't think it's it's not concerning. Although, of course, I didn't say concerning. I said, does it matter? It, it doesn't. All? It doesn't. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, they do. I would disagree with you. I would they disagree do. with both of you. I would say I wouldn't say it matters a whole lot, but I would say it matters because if Inter Miami look, these these players are competitors, and anything they do, whether it's playing uh, foot tennis, foot foot soccer, or sorry, soccer tennis, like they did on Saturday, they want to win. And if you go into preseason with just you know, or excuse me, the regular season with just one win. I don't know if that necessarily helps a whole lot in terms of the confidence or in terms of how you how you're coming off of preseason. If you've won a few games, like you've lost a few games, then I th- then obviously it's you know it's preseason. But if you only won one, which that's what Inter Miami has won to this point against Universitario, from a competitor standpoint, I don't think that that's necessarily uh, the best thing for the team. I don't. Th- I'm not saying it's the worst thing. It's not like the sky is falling, but I don't think it's the best thing from a competition standpoint and from where you know the the state of the team from a uh an emotional standpoint or, or a, a psychological standpoint i think winning breeds confidence and you, you need to do that even in preseason and at least in some spurts to, to to really get the ball rolling i actually heard there was some frustration with drake calendar after saturday or excuse me after friday because of the two blunders that he committed um that helped CF Montreal turn the game around very late, uh, or at least in that second half. So I think winning in preseason, although it's not the most important thing, I think it is somewhat important because, again, it does impact confidence to some level. That's just my opinion, my analysis. But anyway, we'll leave it there. We have a very special guest coming up next. We will talk to him about his thoughts on Inter Miami and much, much more. He is a member of Vice City, so that's the nugget we'll leave before we speak to him. We'll talk to him after this. Okay, everyone, so we said we would have another guest on this week's podcast, and he is here to give us a fan's perspective of this revamped Inter-Miami side. He is a diehard of the team, a season ticket holder since day one, and an original member, also known as an OG, of supporters group Vice City 1896. His name is Cesar, no last name like Madonna, and Cher. Hermano, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing great, guys. Uh, Thank you for having me on. No problem, brother. Thank you for joining us, taking the time to talk some Inter-Miami on Miami Total Football Radio. So we have a lot of questions for you because we want to get a fan's perspective as the season draws near. But just to start off, just to start off and and so that people out there, the listeners out there, can familiarize themselves a bit more with you. Where are you from? Give us a little bit of your background and how you became an Inter-Miami fan. Well, um, my name is Cesar. Um, I'm a born and raised Miamian. Um, I, I know most of the people have, you know, clubs that they follow, but my club has always been in Miami. I've never had a club that I grew up with. Um, I'm just a Miami boy. When I heard that MLS was coming to Miami, I, I got excited. I, I knew this was the future of sports. 
So, um, you know, I didn't want to keep that uh, that that whole idea of like, oh, Miami's are bandwagon fans. I'm like, I'm not a bandwagon fan. I'm gonna be there from the beginning, and then and here I am. I'm still here three years later, three plus years later. Still standing. But how have you, how's it how's it sort of been? Has it been enjoyable or not? Because obviously the you know the first couple of years on the pitch hasn't been that great, and then there was the pandemic. It's always seems like this, you know bit of bad luck associated with, but the fans keep keep turning up. Has it been as, as fun and, and good to follow the team as you thought it would be, or has it been frustrating to see them maybe not do as well on the pitch as you as you want them to? Well, um, I mean, like I said, I, I'm, I guess I'm like an amateur uh, you know, football fan. I This is my first team that I, I follow. I think a lot of people, you know, they heard the big names and they, you know, they started falling in love with the, with the club. But um, because of the big names that were associated with it, but for me, I'm gonna be honest with you. I've never, I never followed these, you know, these all-star players. How you know the most, of the, the most of the fans have followed them. So, to me, I fell in love with the colors, you know, before uh-huh. anything. I fell in love with the name before anything. Um, I fell in love with the dream before anything. Um, I mean, do we, do we expect something better? Do we, you know, do we hope for the best? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, I think everybody, you know, like, you know, it's a bright, you know, it's a shiny new toy, and everybody wants to like, you know, play with the new toy. But, um, you know, when reality settles in and you realize, you know, like this is actually, you know, a, a whole industry, you know, and there's a lot of moving parts. I think, you know, you start realizing like, you know, it, this, is, this is a real team. Um, I mean, from the fans perspective, I, I mean, I've, I've made some of the best memories I've ever made in my life. We've traveled to like, I don't know how many cities already. We have invaded L.A. We've invaded Chicago. I, I mean, I can't ask. How many, how many, how many other stadiums have you been to? Have you been to on the road? How many times? On the road already? Me personally? Yeah. Oh, man, I mean, I, I, since St. Peter, St. Petersburg, the first preseason game ever, when Pizarro scored to Boston, uh, the last home, the last uh, game of the season last year. I mean, I've, we've gone everywhere really. Brilliant. I mean, we got we got members in, in the we got members in Vice City that have never missed a game home or away. Amazing. I mean, there's there's yeah, it's crazy. There's there's people that have like really like fallen in love with the culture and. And what we've been doing, and like I said, I've I've created bonds that I never would have expected. You know, in the beginning it was all hype and oh, we're you know Miami, and but the brothers and sisters that I've made through Vice City and and in the North Side is, I don't know, it's, uh, you can't compare it really. And Vice City has represented from from the start practically. You guys have been there through preseason games, like you mentioned, to regular season games when things have not been going well. And I listen, I've covered MLS for a long time. I've seen all different types of supporters groups. And Vice City is certainly different in the in the way that they they provide a different type of atmosphere, a more Latin American type of atmosphere, and the passion that is with comes with that is definitely, for me, my opinion, very very different. Cesar, what is your background? I, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure where the background or where your family is from. Well, I was I was born here, like I said, I was mm-hmm. born and raised in Miami. Um, my mother is Cuban, and my father is Venezuelan. Okay, so Cuban Venezuelan. Okay, and yeah. how did you get involved with Vice City? I know you said you were there from the start, but how did you say? Because obviously, there's three different supporters groups. Well, there are now today, but how did you get involved with Vice City, and how did how did it all start for you? I mean, this is one of my favorite uh, one of my favorite stories, really. But um, but the original guys in Vice City, I, I, we, we don't shy away from it. We met when we were in Southern Legion. Mm-hmm. Um, we that was the first that when we when if you would Google MLS Miami, that would be the first thing that popped up. But um, but let me tell you. So you know, you type M- MLS Miami and boom, Southern Legion will pop up. And and you know, and I I started going to like um to some U.S. Men's National Team games, and I, I met meet some of the guys, and they're like, hey, we're gonna have a meeting. And then we had a meeting, and and there I met a couple of guys, and and those guys became brothers, and and then from there, you know, we just had a different style of doing things, and we just had you know, I guess a, a different way of thinking. We wanted to take the the fandom, we wanted to take the like Inchala, we wanted to take it somewhere else, you know, we wanted to revolutionize the MLS. We didn't want to keep doing what the MLS was doing. We wanted to, like, you know, change, you know, the idea of what it is to be an MLS fan. That was always, like, our thing, you know. Like, we need to, like, you know, get the good components of what we grew up with or, or what these guys taught me. Uh, you know, Ignacio, Carrizo, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of guys, you know, from the beginning that, you know, um, Luis Felipe, Javier. These guys taught me, you know, you know what it is to be, like, a real hinchada, a real barra. Right. Um, and we wanted to get the great components, you know, the no, the not the organized crime, leave the violence at home. You know, we're just going to party. We're going to, you know, go all out. We're going to fall in love with the colors. And and I met these guys and we created a bond and we started grilling. We started hanging out and we're like, you know what? I think we're the Vice City Boys. And then we started joking around. At first it was like a joke. Oh, Vice City Boys, Vice City Boys. And then we're like, oh, shit, like we're, we're the Vice City Boys. And then people were like, oh, we want to join. And we're like, join what? And they're like, we want to join you guys. And we're like, what are we? 
And then we like we had a real like face to face, you know. We had to like a real like you know heart to heart, like yo, you know, like what are we gonna do with this? And then we were like, all right, let's do it, all. let's let's blow it up. So we started, you know, recruiting, and we started bringing, you know, we always told someone like, oh, bring your closest friend, bring the closest friend that you think would fall in love with it. And that's how we started, you know. We just started grabbing our closest friends, and we're like, hey, I think you're gonna love this. And we started grilling, we started hanging out, we started going to like you know, uh, sporting events together. Um, I remember like one of the first times we ever hung out was like uh, I think it was Chile versus Peru. We went to that game over there in the Hard Rock, and you know, like, oh, it was a great game. I was there. I was oh, there another one. I think well. went to was it Bayern? Bayern? Uh, Real Madrid was it in the Hard Rock? I, I was not know. here we for you. I was the... I was still in New York at the time, but I was definitely here for the Peru Chile game for sure. But but I mean, we went to a couple games together, and like you know, we just got real tight, and and then people started like loving what we were doing. They loved the designs. They loved the feel. They loved the vibe. Uh, you know, and and like I said, I never really grew up with it, so I never really knew like if we were doing it right. But then we started having like new people show up and they're like, yo, I feel like I'm at home or I, this reminds me of home or I haven't done this in years. And like those when people would tell me that, like, that's how I felt I'm like, oh, we're doing something right. You know, like if people are, are, are feeling like they're back at home or they're feeling like a piece of home is with, with them, then this is the right way that we're doing. We're doing it the right way. Yeah. And so you said people have fallen in love with it. And, and I definitely would agree with that because I've you know, you guys have been. Nice enough with me to allow me to come and, and hang out and cover some of your pregame tailgates, some of the postgame uh, festivities as well on different occasions. And clearly, clearly, there's a very happy and festive and passionate ambiance and environment around the group. And I know you guys just had renewals. I think the renewals were, were very, very high. Can you share some insight as to what Vice City's renewal rate for 2022 is in terms of membership? Well, I mean, we, uh, we, I mean, when we talk about renewals, we're just basically, I, I always say Vice City is great because of its people, you know, we, you know, Vice City, each individual person in there is what makes Vice City, you know, what it is, you know, when you look at the North Stand, it, it's, it's, it's the, the magnitude of it is because of everybody's grain of sand that they put in, you know, and, and you know, our membership, if you could go online, our website is vicecity1896.com. We have a, a membership tab there. Um, we offer a membership, and basically what it is is just like you know we, we ask for a membership. You know everybody puts in their grain of sand, you know. So when you see a flag there, that you you feel like you own that flag, you know that flag was part of you, you know you helped you know make that happen. You see a, an amazing TFO drop, you were part of that. You helped you know put that uh, you know you know create that, and that's all we really we, we ask our members, you know, just to like you know put in that little grain of sand, help you know push the you know for the greater good, you know help push you know the dream forward. Um, and I we you know what I what I want the fans the the members to um. What I want the members to to feel is I want them to feel like you know this this is theirs you know I want them to feel like they own it and and um and they should you know I think we've 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 done a lot of amazing things we've gone viral we uh you know we get controversial with the <laughs> sometimes and and I and I and I think that like you know like we should take pride in that you know I love that though on, I, I, I love that brother I, no, I honestly absolutely. love that I mean, MLS we, needs we, more of that MLS one hundred percent needs more of that which is why again I, I appreciate mean, and, what and, you and, guys do not, we don't we don't do it out of you know out of you know out of malice or anything I mean we do it out of love. And um and I like I want to tell our members like you know we take pride in that you know take pride in and all the things that we've achieved you know and and own it you know and uh, and I, I tell people like this is year three already you know this is not the beginning how we're talking about the beginning and all the you know the mm -hmm. glory the, the 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 glitter and the and the shine of the team you know, we've been at this for three years you know and I and I want people to like you know I want our members to to act like we've been here for three years we're not brand new anymore we know we 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 know what it takes we know what it takes to be great we know what it takes to take it to another level. You know, and 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 then we should own that. You know, we should be proud of everything we've achieved, and we should be proud of you know what we're going to achieve. It says you know you you said you're a Miami guy. I guess a lot of your your pals and stuff live around the area as well. What, what about the stadium and getting there and and all that kind of stuff? You know, we know that the, the Mel Reese thing is is bubbling along, but it's going to be ages. What have you found, and how have your mates found like the you know the stadium experience and getting backwards and forwards? Um, you know. Uh, through the traffic and all that other stuff. I mean, thinking about the greater, like, you know, the the mass of the group, um, we have a lot of guys that live in, like, West Palm, Naples, yeah. um, and they come down for games. And, and you know, probably um, there's a good part of the, of the group that really doesn't mind the Fort Lauderdale location. Um, but there's also a part of the group that, uh, you know, we all live down south, and, you know, that, that it's a, it's an hour up and an hour down. Um, you know, it could be pretty brutal. It's 17 times out of the year. Um, I mean... I mean, right now, everybody's, you know, we're cool with it. I still believe we need Miami Freedom Park. I mean, if, if we expect to have these caliber of the players that we expect, if we want to have uh, the Messi's and we want to have, you know, these all-stars that we all dream of, I think we need, uh, you know, like 
you know, world class facilities or you know we need we need something to to you know to sweeten the deal. Yeah, I mean, um, I do, I do think that the, the setup they've got there is is great right now. I think the stadium's cool and the training facility and stuff we go to, and I don't know if you've been there before, but it's yeah. it's decent. But yeah, I do, I, I hear you about the about the commuting. I mean, I, I know the the national team uh, practices at the facilities we have now, and I mean, I'm, the facilities are great. Um, but I think it, like if we want to like really take this to like to the maximum potential, I think we're gonna have to like you know bring it down to Miami. I, I mean, that's a personal thing. I'm sure, gonna be there sure. on the 23rd at City Hall. Uh, I mean, I've been there from the beginning, from the first meeting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna close it out and be with them there, um, to see how it finishes. Um, I believe the commissioners are gonna make the right choice, but you know, I mean, we're, we're just grateful. We're grateful we have a team. We're grateful that you know we have this opportunity, you know, to revolutionize MLS. Um, I mean, it's not gonna, it's not gonna stop by City from going. That's for sure. I mean, we, we said it. By City's gonna, by City's gonna be here forever. Cesar, I wanted to quickly gauge your thoughts on this current team, this younger, revamped, overhauled roster that has been fine-tuned over this winter. What are your thoughts on the group now as compared to the one that finished 2021? Um, I mean, me personally, as like, you know, I guess like a, an American sports fan, or you know, I've been following the MLS a little bit more, I guess some of the guys, I, I to me, this is more of like an MLS club. You know, if you look at the MLS clubs that like, you know, have gone far and actually achieve things, I mean, I think this is a little bit closer to uh, what we've seen. Um, so I'm very excited about it. I love the Yellen pickup. I think he's going to be great. I think he's going to be like a nice little veteran there for like some of the younger guys. Um, I think I saw like the average age of the team is like 22 or something like that. That's amazing. I, I, I think I think this is really like what we, what we wanted to see, you know, I think what we expected to see. Um, and there's a lot of names there that a lot of us don't know, um, a lot of us, you know, but I think this is really what an MLS club kind of looks like. You know, I think, you know, everybody wants the big names, and the, you know, but I mean, we, we tried that and it didn't really work out. You know, like we have Matweedy taking a shower at halftime and hanging out on the sideline. <laughs> I, that I did happen. That did, is, happen. You know? that did happen. That did happen. But you did. But you also said you would like to see a Messi in the future. So there's still oh, some mean, element. There's still some it. element of bringing in older players, star players, as long as oh, they're absolutely. of a certain caliber, caliber and certain uh Investment no, no, that, into that, the project. That little video that he dropped the day of the uh, the announcement, or was it like in 2018 in January? Mm -hmm. And he's like, "Oh, David Beckham, give me a car or something like that." Like, I still dream about that. I mean, come on now. <laughs> and what about um, says? So what about Phil, Phil Neville? Do you do, the, do, you, do you, what do you guys think of him and how he's done uh, so far? Phil Neville, right, guy, that man right there, that guy is top notch. He showed up at our, our vice giving. You know, we do like an annual like thank you to all of our members. He showed up there. He shook everybody's hand. He hung out like one of the guys. Nah, for Neville, he's top notch. I mean, I I think right now he's uh he's getting closer to the the regime that he wants. I think he has the people around him that he feel com he feels comfortable with. Him and Henderson, I think him and Henderson, I think they understand each other. I think they they understand the mission. Um, and no, I mean uh, right now, I mean for Neville's been great with us. Um, we you know we've had some problems. I remember in, in Chicago we had an issue. The the, the players didn't come and say hi to us. And he reached out to us and he showed us love and he, and he explained to us how, you know, he's, he wants to change the culture. Um, he, he, you know, he tells us that, you know, his father used to tell him to always, you know, he got to thank the fans, you know, and, and he, he, he gets, he really takes it to like a personal level with us. And, nice. you know, we, we can't ask for anything else, you know, like, I, like I, I had a moment, I had, I was able to tell him, I'm like, listen, I'm like, if we lose, it's fine, but let's lose together, you know, like let's, the fans in the club, we lose together and let's do it together, you know, and if we win, we win together and then the victories will be great and we'll celebrate together, you know. But let's just do it together, and and he understands that, and I think I think this season we're gonna see a, a, a different a different atmosphere, a different culture, and and we're grateful for that. And he definitely understands it because we touched on it uh, earlier in this pod. He was part of the reason, or or the main reason, why this past Saturday's open training session uh, came to be. He he had brought up the idea about the open training session, and that obviously that that helped set the the wheels in motion. So, did you have fun at that? I saw you there for for a brief moment. We said what's up. We dapped up. Did you have fun with the uh, with that practice session? Would you like to see more of that in the future? Yeah, absolutely. I think that was great. I mean, um, I mean, for the most part, I you know for me, like I when I go to the games, I go I go to all the home games and. And I, I go in, I go straight to the North Stand, and then that's it. We, we leave. You know, I, I rarely have an opportunity to, like, explore the stadium. There's still parts of the stadium I've never seen because I, I just, like, I go in there, and I'm just there for, you know, like, to go there, we sing our hearts out, and then, you know, we go to Miss Q. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, I, I had an opportunity on, on Saturday to, you know, to explore the stadium and see parts of the stadium i never I never seen before. I, I you know, I, I grew a new appreciation. Never seen a suite. I was able to walk into, like, a suite. 
Um, I mean, it was a lot of cool stuff. Um, the, the the players you saw at the end, they came, they came around and they didn't shy away from it. All the players fucked up right up to the fans. They were not shy about it. I think I think that's Neville right there, you know? Like, you got to face the fans. Um, but, yeah, I was really excited about it. It was great seeing, like, all the younger uh, the younger uh, play, uh, uh, players out there. I'm really excited to see um, Akona Edison. He's he's great with us. He's awesome. Real cool guy. Um, Andre Zulaga. He's, like, a, uh, one of our, our goalies out there. I mean, I love seeing the younger guys play. I, I mean, these are people that grew up in, in, my, in the same community that I grew up in. So, like, you know, I, me personally, I take a little more pride in them. You know, so I, that's always a great opportunity, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Now, I want to ask you one more question about the team. And it's preseason, and us on the media side, we always do our preseason predictions. And it's part of the, the role and part of the job. But I'm going to ask you as a fan, and I know Hope Springs Eternal, especially in preseason, does this Inter-Miami team, with all the new faces, and as young and inexperienced as it is, does it make the playoffs in 2022? I mean, does it make the playoffs in 2022? If there's anything I've heard, like, you know, from around the club and, like, people that I've been able to speak to, everybody tells me that we have a real 2022 feel. Like, this season feels like 2022 all over again. So, if that means anything, then, yes, we're making it to the playoffs. <laughs> okay. So, so 2020. You mean 2020, like, the back in the, the expansion season. Yeah, 2020. Season. Exactly. Okay. It feels like 2020 again. So, I'm like, if, if that's true, then we're making the playoffs. You know? <laughs> okay. 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 I did want to ask you quickly before we close out. I know right now it's renewal time. Or not renewal. Sorry. It is... You guys opened up a few more memberships at Vice City um, for people that are interested in joining, who want to be part of the of the supporters group and the environment and the ambiance again and all the passion that you guys bring. For those that are interested in becoming a member of Vice City, what do they have to do or how do they go about applying or trying to become a member? Well, the, the easiest way, just go to our social media platforms, uh, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You're going to see we have flyers posted. We have our links out. Um, website is vicecity1896.com you look for the membership tab right there we have our memberships if, if this is something that you've been watching on on tv and you're like wow that's cool i want to be part of it i i highly encourage you to please learn the songs by a membership we have a real tight community it's full of love i mean we're all growing i mean everybody's helping out one another oh i need i need work oh someone is helping you find the job Oh, I, I need help with something. Everybody's out there helping each other. I mean, we have a real nice, tight community. Um, if this is something that you're looking at, you know, if you're new to the city and you don't have, you know, you're looking for a group of friends or something, trust me, get in contact with us. I mean, this is, this is, uh, it's been a, like a real, like, you know, life-changing experience for a lot of people. And, and I'm grateful that, you know, that I've been able to be put in a position where I could, you know, help people like come together and like grow bonds. You know, we, we're grateful to meet these people on, from Nirvana Project. Now, a lot of our members are part of them, and they help volunteer with the Nirvana Project. And, you know, and the, they had the Mammy Marathon the other day. We had a bunch of our members there helping them, you know, and, like, that's beautiful. And that's I, I, what I want Vice City to be. I want Vice City to be a community that's an asset to, you know, the greater community, to, you know, to the, to the masses. Um, but if this is something that you that you feel compelled about, please learn the songs um, and, and sign up. Get involved. I mean, we're, we're here. We're going to be there every game, uh, unwavering. I was going to say, if, if Don Garber, the MLS commissioner, ever hears your, you speak like that, Cesar, he wanted to like freeze you and put you put you in a museum and just say, this is the kind of guy, you know, we were we were sort of targeting. This is the kind of Miami soccer fan, football fan that we wanted and knew that, the, you know, <laughs> you could create this kind of, you know, community and this sort of love for the game just by being just a local guy tapping into it. You know what I mean? It's uh, football so could be a beautiful thing sometimes. It's, it's nice. No, absolutely. And I've learned that. I mean, I, there's no other sport like it. You know, and I grew up playing, you know, American football. I grew up playing, you know, La Pelota, baseball. Um, and there's no nothing. And there's no other sport like it. You know, no other sport creates this bond that, we, that I've been able to create. Um, no other sport has been able to bring people together like that. Can you, I mean, Cesar, can you quickly just explain, just quickly mention what the Nirvana Project is? Uh, Nirvana Project is um, basically it's, they're disabled athletes. Um, these are athletes that have, you know, some sort of disability. Um, they and they they do triathlons. They they run in marathons. They, uh, you know, it's just disabled athletes, and and they're just, you know, doing amazing things. You know, they're doing things that like, you know, people that don't have a disability are are, are shy from doing. Um, and it's a real beautiful thing. They've been around for a long time. I remember seeing them from before. I mean, well, Vice City basically started because we, we got involved with, with a, a tournament that one of them were hosting. Uh, we we're helping out one of our one of our current members, um, Zoe, uh, Chinas' daughter. Uh, we went to we had a tournament with her. That was one of the first times we were able to come out and we hung flags. 
I mean, so we're we're super, you know, indebted to them. You know, they really helped us, you know, like, you know, put our step foot into the community. Um, and they've been great. I, I, I encourage anybody to look them up. Look them up on Instagram, um, you know, on Facebook. They're on, I believe on Twitter also. Um, but they okay, do a just lot of, the, the, you know, the Nirvana project, anybody right? who's, I'm sorry? It, the, they could just look for the, the the Nirvana project, right? The Nirvana project. Um, yeah. I mean, if you know anybody who has a disability and and they're just staying at home, link them up with these people, man. These people are great people. They're they're a whole like blessing on their own. Um, cool. Yeah, yeah, they're they're really cool. Um, and they go they go to the games. You you look at them. They're usually there in the front row, right there, right behind the goalie. And they sing and they cheer. And they're one of us. I mean, they're one of us. They're they're members. I mean, they're members that are just part of the Nirvana project also. So I mean. They're, they're one of us. Oh, by the way, um, tomorrow, Thursday, uh, the 10th of February, we're going to be at Vesta Sewer Brewery with Nirvana Project. It's actually uh, Nirvana Project is having an event. They're kicking off their uh, their their run season. And uh, we're going to be at Vesta Sewer. And a percentage of whatever is consumed at Vesta Sewer tomorrow is going to go back to Nirvana Project. So we're inviting everybody out there. It's on all our social media platforms. You can check it out. Um, just go there. Have a good time. Mingle with us. Get to know us. Um, you know, see our faces, um, ask us any questions you might have, uh, drink some beer, spend some money. You know, we're going to help out a good cause. Um, we'd love to see all you, all you out there. It's, um, you know, we're taking take it as like a meet and greet. You know, we want like new members to come out, see our faces. We also have an event on Saturday the 12th at Soccer Planet. Um, the grill turns on at 1230. We're going to have food. We're going to have drinks. Uh, we're going to play some football. We want new members to come out. We want people to come out, see us, meet us. Um, we want people to get involved with the family. And Vestasaur is in Wynwood, correct? Yes, it's in Wynwood. Okay, and you're but you're not in Wynwood right now. You're like by an airport somewhere because we can hear the planes. I, I I imagine you just campaigning outside of Mel Reese right now. I just feel like you're over there oh, with, no, with no, a no. sign. I, 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 I uh, I'm out there every day picketing. No, I'm, uh, <laughs> no, I I live by the airport. I live I, I live I live a couple blocks from Mel Reese. I, I'm in a city of Miami resident. Um, I'm a District One resident. So like the whole Miami Freedom Park thing is a real you know it's a personal thing to me also. So you definitely, definitely want that to happen so, as soon as possible because you could probably oh, just you just walk. You could have the march to the match from your house or, or your place. Oh no, no, we're marching from my house for sure. I'm, I'm charging parking. Sorry, guys, <laughs> doing it. Or like the Orange Bowl. <laughs> okay, so, so well, listen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for all that you and Vice City 1896 do for the environment, the atmosphere, and the passion that you guys bring to Drive Pink Stadium before, during, and after. The matches, obviously, as well for the greater community. Steve and I, obviously, we're in the press box. And, you know, there's no open window in the press box, unfortunately. But still, we can hear you guys at full voice in todo pulmón, as we say in Spanish. And we really, really appreciate everything you guys do. And thank you so much for coming on. We hope to talk to you again later on in the season as things have unfolded. And we've had a few games uh, under the Inter-Miami belt. So thank you again, brother. And we will talk very, very soon, okay? Thanks for coming on, mate. Appreciate it. And enjoy the no, season. Guys, thank you so much for giving me this platform. I really appreciate your time and your and everything you guys do. All right, guys, so I just want to say one more time thank you to Cesar Cesar for the time. It was nice talking to him and getting a fan's perspective of the state of the team. As we have said in recent weeks and since the turn of the new year, we plan to have a range of guests this year and from all different from all different spectrums and all different realms. So that's just another one for you guys. We hope you enjoyed it. But it's Q&A time. Let's get to it, guys, because we have a few questions. I'm gonna not obviously we're gonna not hit every single one because there's there's so many, but let's try and pick in, uh, a few from this week. So let's start with Elder Bar, and I'm going to let Steve and Primo Brenner defend himself here because <laughs> I thought, I saw this question and I I had a good chuckle. I had a good chuckle, and he says, "Why does Primo get bent out of shape when Phil gets criticized? Seems like he's Phil's lawyer." Also, does anyone hold Beckham accountable for the Matuidi mess, or is it just play, blamed on McDonough? Seems Paul signings are paying off the mess. Steve, the floor is yours. Defend yourself, my I'm friend. I'm not getting bent. I, when when did I get bent out of shape? I think I, I need I need proof. I need I need proof of this. The um, last few episodes, no. I, I imagine, or all the no, episodes I'm... that have ever been in existence on Miami Total Football Radio. <laughs> no, I'm not defending him. I just I just think you you you're you're very negative anyway. 
but by nature. Um, there, there it is. There and, it is. There it is. Let's and I'm, I'm just trying to be a bit more positive and just give the guy a bit of breathing space. First season didn't wasn't his squad. They've had to rebuild the squad. Now it's his it's his team, as I'm sure he'll say, and he'll be judged, as I'm sure he will agree on. Uh, yeah, on, on what happens this this season. So. Um, yeah, no, I don't. I, a very I don't diplomatic it's all, it's all, answer. It's all very happiness and light. I just try and be a bit more positive than Franco, who's like the purveyor of, of doom sometimes. So there you go. And I have a question for El Primo now. I'm going to get in the Q&A. Nice, nice. Okay. Do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I do have a question for El Primo. Okay. First 10 games of the season, no wins for Inter Miami. Is Phil in trouble or not? Oh, well, yeah, of course. Yeah, 100%. It would be, yeah. If he hadn't. Yeah, for sure. I would have thought so. What, lo- lose the first 10 straight games? I think, yeah, the pressure... The no, pressure no, no, would... no, no. no wins, no wins. Well, no wins? No wins. Yeah, the, look, if, if you can want to think about what that would be like right now, the kind of stuff that we'd be talking about that would be swirling around the club, yeah, the pressure would be intense, wouldn't it? It would be. Yeah, for sure. But that's 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 football, isn't it? You know, you've, you've got to, you've got to win, win matches. Not winning any in 10 is, is... Anyone would be under pressure. All right, on record. Okay. There it is. Yeah, well, I'm not going to say. Yeah, yeah I'm not going to sit, sit here and say, oh, yeah, no, he, he'll, you know, that would be absolutely great. That's exactly what, what they want, you know, and of course, no, it's, that would be a thing. We're not going to get to that point, now, are we? <laughs> the lawyer fees are going to, uh, to get reduced there, uh, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question comes from Roger T. Any early impressions of Campana, Rivaldo, and Duke also? Has Matuidi been bought out yet? So. I'll start, if that's okay. Matuidi has not been bought out yet. Clearly, they have not been able to come to an agreement because if they had, they would have already announced that he's not on the roster. So I imagine Matuidi is is proving a a tough cookie to crack or a tough nut to crack in terms of coming to terms on on a buyout. I imagine he wants to, uh, like we've joked about, maybe just chill on his boat here in South Florida and, and cash out that that big paycheck that he's getting or that he's set to get this year. Now, as for the impressions of Campana, Rivaldo, and Duke, we haven't seen much of Campana and Rivaldo because we've only seen them in short spurts at different training sessions before they, they suffered their injuries. Duke, I was impressed with in the 15, 20 minutes that we saw on day one of preseason. But that was long ago, and he's also now recovering from an injury. I don't know if you guys have anything you want to add with regards to those players. Not seen. I haven't really seen a you know a, a great deal. We we liked to do, didn't we, when we saw him uh, training that that first time. We did, um, yeah, we did. Jose did not. Jose was giving me stick for being like, no, oh, I, I like him. I like what I saw from Duke, and Jose was giving me some stick there at practice about it. Ah, oh, well, there you go. Disgusting. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. It's too early. It's too early. Young player, too early. All I said was I liked what I saw from him in, in the practice session. I didn't say, oh, my gosh, he's going to be a starter on this team and score 10 goals and deliver 10 assists. I just said I liked what I saw from him in that training session. He scored a goal or something like that or a good pass or a good cross. The one thing you saw from him and now you're telling him the, like his – The one thing, the one thing. I liked what soft. I saw in general in the small-sided game that he played in and how he, he looked on the ball in addition to the golazo – that he scored because he scored an outright golazo in that open part of training session on day one. Okay, but yes, we, we haven't seen a whole lot of them because they've all either played very little or been injured. So there's not really first impressions to give. We, we you know, the jury's still out uh, by and large, obviously. But even for first impressions, I think the jury's still out for first impressions with regards to them. Next question from Dose Knows. What's going on with the pink jerseys? Any idea when they're going to launch? Yedlin number two should be a bestseller. Will they be releasing a third kit? People love jerseys. I would ask Steve to start there, but I know his jerseys are not his favorite thing. Go ahead, so. go ahead. No, you no, go. You no, go, you I go. I, listen, fe- the, the jersey will launch this month because season's at the end of the month. The first game is at home. That jersey will be launched between now and then. I would not be surprised if it happens... Around February 19th. Around February 19th. So that's just uh, that's just my I mean, sensation. That's, that's the way to go, right? You, you have to build an excitement before the first game. I don't know. Why I think it? they should have released it by now, right? Like, why not for, release it by now? Like, well, don't you want people before, to buy yeah. it? Don't you want people to buy it so that, like, they can have it for the first game and the stadium can be, you know, decked out in as much pink as possible? Like... I don't understand the thought process in waiting so much. Like the longer you wait, too, the more chances that there are for uh, for it to leak, right? So I'm, you know, we've already seen some images come out, although there have been contradicting 
uh, or contradicting information from the inside as to whether it's that's the authentic jersey or not. I imagine it could be the replica version, and maybe there's a, a more authentic one with different designs on it. But I think that's more or less what what we'll see, though I don't know for sure. But yeah, I, I agree with Steve there. Not sure what they're waiting for, why it's taking so long just to launch the... the I don't see it as a big deal for them to do an, uh, an event before and get all the local outlets out there, you know, and just trying to build up some some hype before the the start of the regular season. So it would make sense to me. Maybe I'm not that um, into jerseys and maybe not not that big of a deal for me. Okay, well, let's do two more here from the from the Q&A session. Next one comes from Don Cafecito. What are you most looking forward to from the team in the Carolina Challenge Cup? Jose, we'll start with you. Well, it, it's, it's still preseason, but, you know, when it comes to a tournament and you're playing for a trophy, I think it gets a little bit more exciting. Um, I, I think the one thing for me is uh, I always like that competition between USL teams and MLS teams. I love to see that. I know I love the USL as well. So I, I, I it's it's not very often that we get to see those matchups. Charleston Battery will be competing in the tournament, the lone team from from USL Championship. So, um, you know, I like the fact that you're you're playing for something. So. Hopefully, you know, we, we get to see a little bit more of the formations. Again, that's my favorite part of preseason, seeing how teams are shaping up. And <laughs> Clearly, we nerded out for like half an hour <laughs> on yeah. the formation. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's that's it's, exci- it's exciting, man. And, and I think it's an opportunity as well, going back to you, what you were mentioning before, chemistry. You know, the team will be out there and, you know, they're, they're going to spend time around each other 24-7 training and playing games and and you know hopefully a, a good a good outcome come, comes out of it of course you're going to be facing you know a quite interesting opposition in columbus crew and and we'll see what charlotte fc looks like so um they play against nashville i think a couple of days ago and they end up losing that game 2 nil. so a lot to learn from preseason and from from the cop i really love the format and i think they play one as well i don't know if they still do it in, in arizona and um, a few years ago, MLS did broadcast those games, and that was interesting to watch. So I don't know if they are available this year, but if they are, I, I would recommend you watching. Steve, what are you most looking forward to from the team in the Carolina Challenge Cup? Yeah, just to be, I think, competitive, wasn't it? You know, we mentioned just before about results and things like that. And it, yeah, it won't be easy. Columbus first, and then and then they, they play the Charleston team, yeah, and then finish off against, against Charlotte. So, um, yeah, just wins and something positive to talk about or more positive to talk about i will say <laughs> i will say that i'm looking forward to seeing how the team does with the ball now with uh some more pieces now healthier or closer to full fitness and in place we'll see some of the andre yadlin i imagine we'll see gregory back in there we should see Le- leonardo campana and maybe emerson rodriguez and we haven't seen those players this preseason so uh, especially the ones in the attack so i'm looking forward to seeing that's what i'm most looking forward to seeing is the attacking contributions that those players can give uh, during this this upcoming three game tournament for Inter Miami. Next question comes from N Dill. He says, "Shouldn't we have more patience with this new Inter Miami side, especially during preseason, where the goal is to get acclimated to one another and raise fitness? Because it seemed like you didn't have any patience last episode." And he puts a couple of emojis in there, raised eyebrow oh. and scratching chin. So that's that's directed more at me, I imagine. Exactly. And, yeah. And, See the and, negativity. And, 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 you imagine, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and look, I, I'll say this. I will say this. If being critical of a team that finished. And I'm going back to last season, but being critical, because Steve called me negative, if being critical of a team that finished in 11th place and missed the playoffs in 2021 and finished in 10th place in 2020 is being negative, then I am negative. And I will gladly be negative because I don't know how much positivity and roses and compliments and accolades and praise you can give a team that is that low in the table. So... That's just my take on it. As for last week and in, in, in terms of preseason, yes, patience is what they've preached. Yes, this is going to be a process, but I'm only good, I can only give you what my eyes see. So if I don't see very good football, like I did not in the Universitario game in that first half, then I, that's, I, I'm going to tell you that. I cannot lie to you. I'm going to tell you what my eyes tell me. So um, that's just my stance. I don't know if you guys have anything you want to add before we uh, actually, we'll hit we'll hit one more question. But um, I don't know if you guys have anything you want to add there. 
we're, we're realists. I don't think we're overcritical. I don't think we're over positive. We're just sort of seeing it how it is. And they've been a yeah side that struggled for the last couple of years, but you know, have done well considering everything that's been going on. I think I do tend like, to be a little more critical and you a little more positive. Just you to, are more critical, yeah, for sure. 100%. Or, or negative, yeah. negative as you. <laughs> you know, as I've you. never said they're, the, they're the, most, the best team in the world or whatever. I just think there's been a lot of mitigating circumstances. But this season, I think, will show a lot of where the club is at in many different ways. Last question. It's not even a question. It's more of a statement. And this one, again, is for you, Primo. you got to defend yourself. Not defend yourself. Just, you know, this, is, this one's been a little tongue-in-cheek. But it's from Atlanta Herons. Primo might have to be downgraded to Primo Segundo status after that Orlando City comment last week. Dot dot dot. Uh, was he talking about the the tweet like the about the not following the, the I don't, other team? I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know Twitter, if it was because or you, I was man- yeah. or, or was I coaching them in, in football manager? I mean, I'm not two. coaching them anymore. Dale DK gave me a terrible hard time. I lost four games in a row and I quit and I've gone to River Plate. So. That part of my managerial career is over, and if I upset anyone into Miami, I apologize. <laughs> and, um, you know, they will, a club will always be close to my heart. There T- you go. T- tell the people the truth. Tell the people that the pressure you felt from, from the reaction to you saying that you were coaching Orlando City, that that is what led you to resign and say, I am no longer coaching Orlando City and football manager. You, you yeah. imploded on purpose. Tell them the power, truth. power to the people, power drove me out (laughs) (laughs) okay well then that does it for the Q&A session uh, on this week's show let's give our final thoughts and we'll wrap up the show after that starting with Jose alright final thoughts Um, well uh, there was an open training so I checked my notes I had to go all the way pre-pandemic time March 11th 2020 there was an open training Diego Alonso was there, Paul McDonough as well. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I, you know, as part of my final thought, I had I have to give a uh, a shout out to my friends at the Deportivo Cali Academy here in Miami. I was there this week, and they they told me they they were listening to to the podcast. So, uh, really a huge thank interesting. You. Yes, they have been listening. They 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 told me. I'm going to tell you exactly what they told me, that they were looking for Inter-Miami info 24-7. They couldn't find it anywhere else, you know, any of the other outlets. They um, they don't want to hear about the Dolphins, Miami Heat, or any other sport, just soccer, Inter-Miami. And so they found Miami Total Football Radio, so huge shout-out to them. And thank you for listening. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Awesome to hear glad to hear that's what we that's what the goal was when i started this and then when steve came on board and then when jose came on board as well to provide you with as much inter miami information as possible so we try to give you all encompassing information be it inside info our opinions our analysis our positivity our negativity all of it so steve your final thought yeah just to echo echo that also remember that to leave us a review uh, if you haven't done done already, and yeah, just keen to see how the next kind of week unfolds as the you know pre- preparations really kick on, um, and yeah, we'll hopefully uh, get to speak to some more players and, and managers and see uh, see what they're trying to do because it's been a little bit quiet over the last sort of week or so. So my final thought will be on the event I attended on Tuesday night at Drive Pink Stadium, and it was Inter Miami formally announcing that they were launching the campus, the first campus in, I believe, in the United States with the Global Institute of Sport. And it was a very, very formal event. Uh, Maybe not very, very formal event. I'll take that back. It was a formal event. Jorge Mas was there. Chris Henderson was there. Jorge Mas uh, had had a speech for the, the people in attendance. And they cut a ribbon. And there was an open bar and very, very good hors d'oeuvres, which I definitely enjoyed. The hors d'oeuvres, not the open bar. Um, And it's another, you know, it's not really soccer specific, but it is another sign that Inter Miami is trying to to grow within the community, to grow in with the South Florida community. And at large, once again, Jorge Mas did mention during his speech that that the goal is to be one of the biggest teams in this hemisphere. So... This is part of you know the business side of things, not necessarily the soccer side of things, but nonetheless, I think it's it's slightly notable um, as well. So that does it for this week's show. Thank you guys again, of course, as always, for listening. Thank you for Cesar of Vice City. 
for joining us. Thank you to Jose Armando. Thank you to Steve Brenner. I am Franco Penizo. This is Miami Total Football Radio. We'll talk to you guys again next week.